Thank you, Tom. So today I'm going to go in a little bit different direction. I'm going to give kind of some uh, some introduction slides. I just saw a tweet that said, uh, suggestion to Open Open West presenters, please skip the introduction slides. No. <laughs> They're here for a reason. I'm not going to talk about myself. I'm going to talk about why I'm going to talk about the code that you'll see a little, little bit later on. I want you guys to get the uh, get this in your heads so you understand kind of where I'm coming from. There's this statement that I've come up with, and I spent some time crafting this statement to kind of explain what we're getting at with SALT in general. Um, the future of technology is dependent upon our ability to effective, effectively utilize infrastructures at any scale. Now when I say utilize, I don't just mean monitor, I don't just mean manage configuration, I mean use, utilize. When I say any scale, I mean one server, or I mean tens of thousands of servers, or hundreds of thousands of servers at any scale. When I say technology, I don't just mean computers. I don't just mean servers. Uh, let's go back to uh, ye olde days. Um, what was one of the great things about Rome? What's that? It wasn't built in a day. <laughs> they had this really great, what? Gladiuses. Gladiuses? Let's go a little bit more low tech than that. One really awesome thing that Rome had that a lot of people don't think about was the aqueduct. Who said that? Plumbing. Let's look at plumbing as a technology. That's a really important technology that comes out to infrastructure. Right now we have this massive infrastructure of plumbing that includes sewers, it includes toilets, it includes uh, sinks and includes all sorts of things that go into this whole plumbing infrastructure. At the smallest level of plumbing infrastructure we have some sort of body of water, right? Technically a lake is a single unit infrastructure of plumbing, right? I bring that up because I, I explain to people that I actually use salt on my local notebook a lot because the, inter the uh, interfaces that I've set up are easier to use than the native interfaces for a lot of programs. That's one of the other awesome things about SALT. Um, we also uh, we have several users that are using SALT for tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of machines at any scale. So this is kind of important. Um, let me move on to, uh, to what SALT does. A lot of people when they hear SALT they think of configuration management. And Tom covered this a little bit in his talk. Seth talked about this a little bit. Configuration management is one of the things that SALT does. Uh, remote execution is one of the things that it does. I don't see SALT as a config management uh, system. I see it as a framework. I see it as an API. I see it as a way to get other things done. It also does cloud management. It does monitoring. It does alerting. It responds to alerts. We've joked several times about ordering pizza. Uh, and yes, we have looked for public pizza APIs. They're not, they're not uh, really out there at the moment, unfortunately. I guess they died out in 2009. It's sad. Somebody needs to get on that. But uh, these are some of the things that SALT does. But remote execution is kind of the, uh, the fundamental thing that I want to talk about. Every single thing that, we, that I listed on that slide is a function of distributed computing. And distributed uh, computing is something that we do with remote execution, right? Uh, one of the uh, earliest forms of distributed computing that I used to use was an SSH loop. Who's, who's done that? Did we use it for configuration management? Anyone? Raise your hand, anyone? A couple of us? What else did we use it for? Jake, what did you use it for? Didn't you raise your hand? Oh, well, I just, yeah, I just used it for I used to use it in a classroom environment to reboot machines. I would send out a command to uh, wipe out the boot sector, and then I'd reboot the machine, and then I'd have the machine pixie boot. Kind of sort of configuration management, not really. Um, it's more of a form of distributed computing. So when we think about distributed computing, why not use salt to do other things that we use distributed computing for, right? Now, with that in mind, I want to talk about some people, <laughs> some of the, uh, we could call them competitors, but I don't think that's really the right thing. Chef does, some would say, a really good job of configuration management. Puppet does a really good job 
at configuration management. CF Engine, they're kind of the, the early ones on, right? Uh, configuration management would not be in the state that it is today without CF Engine. And it would not be in the state it is today without Puppet building upon CF Engine. I can't speak for that one. I don't even like their name. I don't think they've earned it, but that's something else entirely. I would just want to point out that these guys, they're focused on configuration management, and SALT goes way, way, way beyond that. I also want to point out that SALT is not playing the same game. You notice we've got some children here playing checkers. We have the grown-ups over here playing a lot of chess. This also brings up a, a matter of scale, right? We have a lot of things going on concurrently here at this chess tournament. I want to talk about some of the things that should be salted. They're not salted yet, uh, though some of these do have some form of remote execution already working on them. Uh, cell phones. You can bet that Sprint has something running on your phone, right? Probably not a whole lot. Uh, T-Mobile, uh, Nextel, I'm sure they've got something running in the background, and that's one of the reasons why we root our phones is to get rid of that stuff, right? Your car, anyone here have OnStar? One guy? <laughs> the guy that lives closest to uh, Detroit? <laughs> um, OnStar is basically a massive network of distributed computing, right? We press the little OnStar button, the lady comes on and says, how, how can I help you? You say, I want directions to such and such. Uh, your car gets in a wreck. Yeah, the, uh, it automatically phones into OnStar and calls, uh, calls the emergency personnel, sends people out. This is a function of distributed computing, right? On a massive scale. Why, are, why aren't we doing this ourselves? Why do we not have salt running on our car and running our GPS and downloading our music and handling these things for us? This is something that salt could and should be doing. Home theater. Um, actually, this was not what I wanted to represent. What I wanted to represent was home automation. Why do we not have salt running our home security system? Why are we not able to hop onto our cell phone and look at images from our home security camera using salt? Wouldn't that be awesome? And this last one here, anyone know what this is? I want to take a guess. It's kind of fuzzy at this low resolution. It's a farm. It's a dairy. The, yeah, this is the, uh, the dairy at Penn State. Why do we not have salt monitoring the milking machines? You guys know there's automatic milking machines now? The cow walks into the booth, it gets hooked up, as it were, <laughs> gets milked, walks out. They have the ability, cows have the ability of some of these dairies to actually get themselves milked, which yields a higher concentration of milk. Why are we not monitoring this with salt? Why are we not managing these things? So now that we have kind of some idea of some of the things that we can do with salt that aren't being done yet, I would love to do all these things, but I'm only one man. <laughs> but these are some, some great ideas. So let's come up with a really, really basic use case, a little bit more in our realm. We want to write, say, a web crawler, something to gather web pages. Something to download web pages and do stuff with. What kind of stuff? In my case, I had a need, especially with my talk tomorrow, I had a need to analyze a lot of recipes for cheesecake. So I had a need to download a lot of recipes for cheesecake. So um, in theory, I wrote a web crawler. In reality, I downloaded all the pages a while ago and wrote the web crawler for this. But you get the idea. So our need is to collect various web pages. Uh, we want to use multiple nodes to collect these web pages. Why would we use multiple nodes? Why not just have one node, one after another? Yes? Distribute it so you can do it in parallel. Do it in parallel. Why else would we want to do it in parallel? You guys familiar, familiar with the slash dot effect? Yeah? No? The idea with the slash dot effect is your page gets posted on slash dot and you get so many visitors that your server goes down. And for some smaller companies, that's probably still a problem. But for larger people, do you think Facebook really suffers the slash dot effect anymore? Let's face it, they have how many millions of users? It's not a problem for them. Are they really going to be uh, watching you to see, uh, 
to see how many times a single IP is, is hitting their page or their servers over and over again? You think? Actually, I, I'm, if I had to guess, I'd say yes. Because if I were running a site like Facebook and I saw a whole bunch of hits one after another that were using a return or a user agent of Python or Perl or whatever, just <laughs> I'd shut it down. I'd blacklist it. They may even be doing that on the uh, the firewall level, right? On the router level. So maybe I use multiple multiple nodes to collect data, so it looks like multiple different clients, right? I could even have fun and have multiple user agent strings that I cycle through and use on different IPs, so I, it looks like I have multiple users from the same IP. These are things that we could toss in there. And then we want to take the web content, we want to return it back to the master for, uh, for storage, for processing, right? So I'm going to use urlib2 for my crawler. Um, it's a library that's, easy, that's it ships with Python. It's pretty easy to use. Uh, anyone here in Python use requests? A couple of people? You want to take a guess at why I'm not using requests? Point three. What's that? Point three. Point three? Because it's not included in the standard library. Because it doesn't come with Python. It doesn't ship with Python. Now, this is kind of going back to the way that, or the reason that I do a lot of things in the, uh, the salt core. Um, I don't like dependencies. I'm not saying that I don't need dependencies. Obviously, the salt module is not going to work. I'm sorry, the, the uh, MySQL module in salt isn't going to work without MySQL. So that's a dependency that's necessary, right? But do I want to install yet a, another library to use MySQL? Not unless I absolutely have to, right? Do I want to use another library to do my URL grabbing when there's a perfectly good one already available? In my case, no. I'm just like that. Uh, however, there are some other great third-party modules out there that uh, may do either better than what you're doing, uh, I'm sorry, better than the module you're using. Um, actually, that's really the only reason. It just it does it better, right? Uh, however, if you use a third-party module, uh, we've got to have some way to make sure that the, uh, the module doesn't try to run without its dependency installed. How do we normally install a mod or include a module? Import module name, right? We'll get to this in a second. Am I going too fast? I feel like I'm going really fast. Questions so far? Okay. So we're going to start off with an execution module. And here's some of the basics. There's a virtual function. That's two underscores, virtual two underscores. It's not technically required, but generally speaking, you should use it. The example I'm going to show you is actually kind of a, a bad reason to use it, but it'll illustrate the purpose. Um, whenever the, uh, the salt minion is spun up, it will run the virtual function and find out what the name of the module is. Uh, this is useful for, say, uh, well, we've got a package module, uh, which we want to be able to run, say, package.install on Ubuntu, on Red Hat, on, uh, on Arch Linux, or whatever. And we don't want to have to specify yum on this system, and apt on this system, and pacman on this system. We just want to specify package, right? So in this case, we use it to say, OK, if I have RPM installed on this system, then the RPM module re will return a package name. Uh, if I have aptitude installed on the system, then we return package from the aptitude module. Um, private functions. These are things that start with an underscore. They're not made publicly available. If you try to run them from the salt command line, it's not going to get, it's not going to work. It's going to tell you that the, uh, the function is not available. Uh, any of you guys use sys.doc? A couple of you guys? Let's show you an example here. Uh oh, I broke something already. This is what I get for writing code an hour beforehand. Oh, guess what, guys? I have to be rude. <laughs> I 
That looks better. So this is the list of all the modules that are available on my own personal machine. If we look down at uh, package, there we go. So I'm running Arch, so on this machine, when I run package dot whatever, it's actually going to use Pac-Man to run all those commands. I think in some earlier versions you would actually see some cruft in there saying this is going to execute Pac-Man whatever. I think those have all been cleaned up, right? We'll see. I guess there's a way to find out. Look at that. So I'm not on a Red Hat system, so it's not going to run RPM dash whatever, right? You notice that uh, if we look through here, there's nothing that starts with underscore. There's plenty of modules in there that start with underscore, but they're not going to show up here. Public functions are the things that are going to show up there. These are the things that we're actually going to call either from the command line, from salt API, from our uh, salt states, from the various ways that we can call uh, functions. Now before we get into writing functions, there's a few basics. PEP8. Who here is familiar with PEP8? Okay, who here is a Python programmer? Raise your hand high. Okay, how many of you guys use PEP8? Okay, as long as we have the same hands going up, we're good, right? PEP8 is a style guide. It is kind of the style guide that people like to go by, by Python, in Python, and it's a good starter. It is not the, st the salt style guide. The salt style guide will supersede anything you see in PEP8. There's not a whole lot. If you follow PEP8, you're generally going to be okay. There's a few little things, and you look at the style guide, like don't use double, uh, double quotes, use single quotes for your doc strings. I don't know, much, not much else. Uh, you should always use doc strings for everything. And if you write an execution module that doesn't have a CLI example, and we'll get to that in a, a few slides, um, well, we'll know about it. Our, uh, our Travis test will break and you'll get emails. And So always have an example in there. Avoid late imports. What do I mean by late import? Tom, what do I mean by late importing? Importing inside of uh, code that's going to be executed at runtime and not at parse time. Right. You guys will see what I mean in a moment. Uh, that doesn't mean we don't use late imports. It means they should be avoided. And logging is really, really helpful. This is the first pr uh, project that I've worked on that's had a really, really good logging system. And it's been really nice to work with. Uh, however, I've also noticed people that are uh, like in a virtual function, they'll, they'll do a log.error. This module is not available. That's not an error. That's not even an, inf an info. In fact, that shouldn't even be a debug. We just don't use the module. Right? Um, in fact, on using the logging system, there's a few basics. These are about the only levels that I think I've ever seen. There's a log.trace that we don't really use. Uh, if you have something that you want to tell everyone unless they explicitly turn off logging, then put it in log.info. If something isn't really right, you're missing a piece of configuration maybe that should be there, but isn't, but you can still keep going, then a log.warn is, is good. Keep in mind, log.warn is a type of error. So if it is not an error of, in any way, if it's just something that's useful, don't use log.warn. Log.error, specifically log.error, something is definitely wrong. I cannot continue unless you fix this. Um, that's what we use the log.error for. And log.debug, that is a good way to fill up disk space. I always use it as I'm developing. I love log.debug. And that's where I put all my stuff in there that uh, normally I used to do uh, like import pprint, pprint dot blah, blah, blah. Now I just do it as log.debug. And it'll show up to me every single time. And I can leave it in the code. And it's not going to bother other people unless they're actually working on, the, on that specific piece of code. So if you have something that as a developer you're the only person that's going to care about or you're other developers will care about. That's where you use the log.debug. You with me so far? 
So sample virtual function. You'll notice that this virtual function isn't just the virtual function. And you'll notice that I'm doing some late importing, kind of. Uh, and you'll notice this is a really bad time to use uh, a virtual function because guess what? URL lib2 is always going to be there, right? So I wouldn't really need to do this. If you have a virtual function that just returns the name, that's, you probably don't need that unless the, uh, the name of the file is different from the module name. If you don't put a virtual function in there, then the module will just identify itself as the name of the file. In this case, my file is called crawler.py and it will identify itself as a module called crawler. Okay. Um, questions so far? Pretty basic stuff. Yes. Um, I may have missed it, but do you want to cover the, the purpose for the virtual function? Um, I may have talked about it a little bit. The question is the purpose of the virtual function. The primary purpose of the virtual function is to identify the name of the module. That is the main purpose of it. Um, if the name of the module is different from the file name, in this case crawler.py, or if the, uh, the module shouldn't be running on this machine for whatever reason, like the RPM module on an Ubuntu machine, you would never return uh, anything for that. You notice how I've got a return false at the bottom there? That means that uh, if we actually get that far, then this module shouldn't run on the machine. It's not going to show up under sys.doc, anything like that. Does that answer your question? Um, I was actually getting at something else. Okay. Is virtual also used so that you can have um, different modules that provide the same functionality for different platforms or under different circumstances? I, I brushed on that, but um, yeah, so for instance, the package module. There's not actually a file anywhere on the system called package.py. There's an RPM package, or I'm sorry, there's a yum package.py, there's an apt.py, there's a pacman.py, and they all, on the appropriate system, will return a name of package, pkg. Is that what you're getting at? Yeah. Okay. And conceivably, somebody else could write another function on this that uses a, a request and have that return crawler instead and behave completely differently. Well. Hopefully the end behavior is the same, but do different things under the hood, right? Does that answer your question? Yes. Okay. And in that case, if somebody started doing that, I would hope that they would uh, be kind enough to go into whatever the, in this case, I actually have this in a different repo. I'll give you links at the end. Uh, I would hope that they would submit a pull rec to have this look for whatever that dependency is and then return faults if that, or return yeah, faults of that dependency is there for the other thing. Does that make sense? Yeah. So in my case, since I'm never going to use requests because I'm just like that, if I find it on the system, then return faults so that somebody else's requests version of crawler will work. Right? Questions so far? So private function, this is something that's only going to be used by other functions. You start it with an underscore so it doesn't show up to be available. Technically, I could probably uh, take out that underscore and use this as a, a public function, function, but that's not its, its purpose. Its purpose is to do one thing, do it really well, kind of the Unix philosophy. In this case, perform a query. Now, some of you may be looking at this and thinking, well, why, did, why wouldn't I just return the result? Why do I even bother doing an entire function for query? Take a look, what do you think? First off, I'm not returning everything that I get from result. There's another dozen or so things that result gives me that, in my case, I don't care about. <coughs> also, if, if you look at that, we have result.url, result.code, result.message. These are all the things that would normally be returned by result. Result.headers.dict might show up. Result.read will not show up if I just return it. Uh, because it's, it's not using a dict, it's actually using a, uh, a method, right? This is, this is going to, you're going to see something fun about this in a moment. Uh, Result.read is also going to return, in this case, a lot of crap. And we'll deal with that. The public function, this is the one that my users are actually going to use. I'm going to call it fetch. 
And you notice that it's asking for URLs and then it's checking to see if URLs is a string or a list. In this case, I can look at it and say, okay, if I got one URL, just go ahead and download it, return it. If I get multiple URLs, then go through individually, get all the information, then return it. Something else really important here. You'll notice that each one of them is using the same return style. So it doesn't matter what I pass through there. In fact, I could go in there and, and say, okay, if URLs is a hash that contains other options to treat this URL differently than this URL. Uh, as long as I return it in that same fashion, then everything that calls this is going to be able to know how to handle it. This is a really important point. When you're writing functions, try to keep all the return data consistent. Because when you get something that's inconsistent, and then you fix it to be consistent, people will yell. Everyone's got a different workflow, right? In fact, last year, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead, go ahead and finish your part. Oh, last year I, I mentioned that maybe we should uh, go in and fitch, or fix network.ping because it just returned the output of ping-c4 whatever. And Tom brought up the point that that module had been like that for well over a year. And if anybody is using it, they will yell at you when you fix it. So consistency is really important. Yes? So, yeah, that's actually kind of related to the question I was going to ask. So the module we're talking about here, its name is Crawler. We saw that before. Right. Right. And there's a public function here named Fetch. And then mm -hmm. you said earlier when we were talking about the virtual function that I could also create, you know, there also could be a module that uses um, the request package that also says that its name is crawler, so it performs the same kind of behavior. Right. And so that way then if I'm looking, if, 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 if I've got code that's looking for the crawler package, either one of those, depending on which one I had installed, would satisfy that need. Right. But what, what enforces that they adhere to the same interface so if I'm, if I'm accustomed to using the crawler package that uses URL lib2, and then somewhere else somebody uses my, my code that's depending on that module, mm -hmm. but it, they've got the one that uses request instead, and maybe it has a, instead of using fetch, it has a retrieve function or something like that. What, what enforces the consistency between two packages with different implementations that claim to offer fulfill the same purpose? I'm going to say what it comes down to with that is peer review. Because somebody is going to come out eventually and try to use one thing when they're expecting the functionality from the other thing. They're not going to work and they're going to complain. Uh, they're going to send in pull requests. They're going, to, they're going to submit issues. And either somebody's going to fix it or it's going to remain broken. Now, if this were to happen with the modules that ship with SALT, it would probably be, get fixed pretty quick. People would pick it up. In this case, uh, I, I actually put together a separate GitHub repo entirely. This is an application that sits outside of Salt, but uses Salt for its communication. And so somebody could come out with another version of Crawler that conflicts with mine. And if they won't fix stuff to match what I'm doing, well, I can either conform to what they're doing or, or users will just be hosed. Okay. Um, and that's really just an open source problem. Actually, I'm going to call that a code problem in, in general. You familiar with uh, uh, printf? Do you know why printf was invented? No, I'm, I'm old, but I'm not quite that old. So the problem, <laughs> the problem is actually the echo command. Echo behaves differently across the different unices. Uh, some of them support dash n, some of them don't. Some, some support dash e, some don't. And so we had all these people trying to use echo across all these different platforms, and it was breaking. Shell, script, script, shell scripts weren't portable when we moved from AIX to HPUX or to Unix or whatever. And so in order to mitigate that problem and also add some new functionality, the printf functionality was introduced into Bash, which will always perform exactly the same way every single time you use it. And so that's what I mean by, by peer review. If something like that is, is so broken and people won't conform or they have their own reasons to do stuff, 
eventually somebody's going to step in and fix it via another means. Um, that's, that's pretty much what it comes down to. Yeah, I, I buy that. I, I guess where I was getting confused is um, I was thinking of kind of how writing an RPM spec file would work, right? If I've got a, I've got a new package and I could say that it requires another package and I could specify that package by name, right. I could also say that it requires a, a role like HTTPD, mm -hmm. right? And there's any number of RPMs that could satisfy that requirement and it doesn't matter which one. And so it seemed like having module names I couldn't tell which one of those it was. Is is it? Am I am I calling out the module specifically by its name, and it only matches to one name, or is it a role that it fills? It seemed like it kind of was crossing the boundary to me. Well, in terms of an RPM package, I would refer to it by the package name, but not you know not the module name. Um, I was just using a more more of an analogy. Right. Okay. I'm with you. Uh, I mean, hopefully, if somebody came out with another crawler built on top of Salt that did different things, and you know, whatever I do is not sufficient for what they do. And let's face it, this is pretty sparse. And if you guys go and look at the GitHub thing after my talk, you'll notice that it's really sparse and doesn't do anything. And somebody could go in and do way more than I did. And I'm arrogant, so I'll probably just ignore that what they did unless they do a really good job. <laughs> um, hopefully, at, at that point. Whoever it is that spins off the new package with the new functionality is going to call it something different and return something different through salt. Um, I mean, let's, let's hope, right? Any other questions before I go on? Tom, what happens with the collisions? Okay, fine. So you've got two <laughs> modules. They're both returning the same name from the virtual function. Right. Um, which means that you can run into a logical colli logical collision. Now, in Salt, we don't have a f we don't have hard enforcement for logical collisions. Uh, basically, how it works is that it overlays the second on top of the first. Now, the reason it works this way in Salt is because you because the plugin modules. So, the plugin modules that are uh, passed into Salt are always loaded after the built-in modules. This means that you can have a module that you're distributing via the underscore modules directory out to your minion, or out to your minions, that overrides individual functions, and then it merges or overlays those functions on top of it, which means that, again, you can say, maybe I want the CMD module, or C the CMD.run function to work a little differently in my environment, you can override that individual component. And so that's why they're merged and we don't do collision detection like we're looking, like we're talking about here. Now, yeah, and then the answer to that, can collisions happen inside of SALT proper? Um, not since that one in 9.2. <laughs> um, because, yeah, we've got really careful processes and tests around just making sure that they don't crop up inside of Inside of the In that case, really, it comes down to peer review. A bunch of people had issues in 9.2. I feel like an old guy now. Back in OT 2, or OT 9. <laughs> anyway, so, uh, no other questions? Okay. A uh, quick note on doc strings use them. Always use them. Every single function that you submit should always have a doc string. And if it is a public function, it should always contain the text CLI example. And if it does not, there will be errors. And the CLI example, you'll notice I've got salt. A lot of this, the examples you'll see have salt, star, you know, function, arguments. I didn't do that in this case because I don't want all my minions to go out and retrieve one URL, that's, that's a waste, right? So in this case, I've pointed out one minion to return that URL, and then it's going to return some stuff, and then the rest of my code goes underneath that, right? So in order to run our new module, 
We've got a couple of different uh, functions. Salt call is a really awesome tool, especially if you add in dash dash local. That will behave on the minion. We run this on the minion. It will behave as if we've run that call from the master, except especially with the dash dash local. It never even talks to the master. It just does whatever it does and then dumps it out to the minion. And then from the salt master, that, well, you saw that in the doc string, right? So let's take a look at this, see what it does. This would have been more awesome if I was not using PDF. Let's try it out. And with salt call, you notice that we didn't specify the minion name because we're on the minion. So we're going to run it locally. We're going to set the log de level to debug. Can you guys see that OK? Do I need to blow it up? I'm not used to this terminal. Ah, come on. I have bad news, guys. We're not used to the uh, X face terminal. That's okay, because we're going to get a lot of crap here. Spoke What's that? Spoke crawler on. Awesome. And now I get to type that in manually. Good thing it's tiny, right? I want to show you what happens if you would do spell it wrong. Looking down at the bottom, function car.fetch is not available. So let's go ahead and fix the spelling. Let's, let's actually fix the spelling. So it's, there's a little bit of a pause because we're actually downloading a URL in the bunker that we're in. And then we got a lot of crap, a whole lot of crap, a whole web page full of crap. And down at the bottom, thankfully, uh, alphabetically, content comes before every single other thing that I return, so no big deal. So we have the headers that we got. We have the, uh, the message that we got. Uh, we don't have code. That's up there somewhere. The code was 200, obviously. Did I even put it in my code? Yeah, code's up there somewhere. Oh, code comes before content, so we didn't see it. And then you'll notice down at the bottom the URL that was returned. This is not the URL that I sent it, because what does tiny URL do? It does a redirect. Let's pipe this over to less so we can take a better look at it. Sans color coding, unfortunately. A little bit of a pause. There's our code, 200 content. You'll notice that it returned a dictionary with the tiny URL that we gave it, just like we told it to. Go back down to the bottom. There's the URL that was actually retrieved. So we have a way of determining whether or not something was redirected, right? Whether or not we're getting the thing that we actually asked for. We have, gosh, somebody tried to set a cookie. And I just ignored it because I didn't do anything with the cookie jar in this, in this uh, agent. You get the idea there, though, right? Questions so far? Any of you guys think you're going to use a web crawler for anything? Couple? Awesome. The problem, though, if we look at this, I mean, this is cool and all. Uh, we've got a bunch of data that was returned to us, right? And we can do stuff with it. Well, what do we do? Can we just take this and plug it into another program? Uh, the problem here is, is it's going to parse really weird. I mean, YAML is nice and all, but we've got this chunk of HTML that's going to throw everything off. So, what? Huh? Is somebody whispering? That output is Okay, it's, it's like YAML. It's Tom's nifty new uh, pretty printer that's even prettier than pretty print. How's that? I like that. If we want to see pretty print, <laughs> prettier print, this is an actual pretty print. Yeah. Isn't that pretty? That's beautiful, isn't it? 
and technically that will parse by Python. How many of you guys take raw Python data structures and feed them into your programs? It's just not common, right? So, and YAML's just gonna screw, screw everything up again because true YAML is still not gonna parse right. But JSON, that's easy to parse, right? Actually it's, and gosh it, Looks familiar. That is not JSON. Okay. There we go. Isn't that pretty? <laughs> it's pretty parsable, and that's that's the important thing, right? And you know what the awesome thing is about JSON? It's still syntactically correct YAML. That's important to us at our office because we love YAML. Actually, the really cool thing is, is uh, YAML has a safe load, and I don't think JSON does. And so a lot of times I'll load JSON with the YAML safe load, and then dump it out with the JSON. I did that somewhere recently. Anyway. So, we still have a little bit of time left, and I've got tons more that we can go into. Um, and yes, I think I mentioned it at the front. I fully intend to abuse the time. If you guys don't have the time, I won't be offended if you leave. For those that do, let's write a salt runner. Now a salt runner is kind of cool. With salt, you specify the minions. You specify a target. You can say um, web star for all the web servers or mail star for all the mail servers. Um, you can specify by um, regular expression. You can specify, specify by grain. All the servers that have Red Hat, they're in the Red Hat family, do this. All the servers that are in the Debian family do this. Um, we can specify by pillar, which those of you that were here for Seth's talk learned a little bit about pillar, we can specify by that. And in our case, we're actually going to use the pillars. Now, salt runners are a way to run one or more execution modules, take the data, and compile them together into something else. Uh, you could think of it as a reporting engine. In this case, it's kind of sort of what we're using it as. Uh, one really basic one is the, uh, the manage salt runner. Manage.up tells you all your min minions that are responding. Manage.down tells you all the minions that you have keys for that didn't respond. And it's a really simple uh, salt runner, and so it's a good one to start off with. So we copy that over to whatever our new runner is going to be called. We make whatever changes we need to make, and you'll pull it, probably throw a lot of stuff away. I didn't. I actually kept most of it. Um, first off, before we write a, a runner, and I don't think I even put a slide in here for the salt run command in this case. I'll show you guys real quick. Salt run manage dot up. That guy is up. Manage dot down. None of my minions are down. I've only got one minion on this guy. Did I mention I use salt locally a lot? And for the astute of you, you may notice that all my servers are named after chefs. And were before I learned about that other program. What's that? Uh, no. <laughs> but bonus points to anyone that figures out who Dufresne was, is. Okay. So the most important thing that we need to learn with a, uh, a salt runner, uh, you're generally speaking going to be using a local client. This is basically kind of an early salt API. This is a way to establish a quick uh, client to go out and do your bidding and come back and return results, not in you know pretty print, not in Tom's awesome outputter. You know, just return it in a data structure that you can do stuff with. And spinning up a client is pretty easy and you probably won't find a whole lot of reasons to ever change that line, except to put it all in one line because you, you're not trying to fit it on a slide. And then we have uh, dictionary equals client.command, or there's also a command.iter or command underscore iter. There's a few different ways to run command. We have the target, which is all machines. In this case, since we stole it from manage, we have a test.ping. That's all that manage does. It pings all your minions and tells you who responded. That's pretty basic, right? 
And then generally speaking, just using the timeout that's configured into salt is probably what you need. If you need like a 30 second or a 30 minute or whatever timeout, you can put it in there. That's, that's a pretty good way to go. Returning output. Um, this is kind of cool. You guys saw that dash dash out that we used. Whatever it is that, you, that your users pass in, this will return it in that format. It saves you a whole lot of work. So we import salt out output. We get whatever it is the data we're working on. By the way, this works for salt modules as well. Um, actually, salt modules just returns to, in the outputter format anyway. Now that I think about it. I'm thinking in terms of salt cloud, which doesn't. Um, anyway, so we get some data, and then we say salt output, uh, display output, whatever it is our data is enclosed in, and you know, I've never even touched those. I don't know what they do. <laughs> I'm just saying it's, it's easy to bootstrap this stuff. So in our case, let's say we have 10 minions, and let's say we only want five of them to do stuff. Maybe the other five, you know, maybe one's a load balancer and we, want it, we don't want it to be doing stuff that's not load balancing. Maybe one's a database, or, yeah, database server and we don't want it to do non-database stuff. We just want to perform things. Tom's laughing at me over there for some unknown reason. We, <laughs> okay. I'm going into stand-up. Um, no, you can't. Cover your ears. Um, we only have a set of minions that we want to use. And so I'm going to set aside some minions that are going to be used for crawling, and I'm not going to use any other minions. Uh, now, I could just hard code them in there. I could just say, okay, only the minions that have my module installed work, but that's really sloppy, and what if somebody accidentally installs something? What if, uh, what if I install something that I don't want to use it later on? What if I want to be able to configure things um, on the fly? It's really sloppy to just run it like that and just you know, spray and pray. All right? So we're going to explicitly say which minions we're going to use, and we're going to configure them on the master since that's where we're running everything anyway. So we're going to set up a pillar. Those of you guys that were in Seth's talk will recognize the pillar. Uh, this is a really, really basic pillar. We're just setting up a top.sls. We're saying only, uh, do I need a dot star? That's right, isn't it? No, that's, that's right. Okay. Um, only the machines that start with the word spider will go out and crawl, right? Well, or more specifically, we'll use the crawler pillar. And then I've set up a crawler pillar. It says, okay, uh, anyone in, inside this, uh, this match, I'm going to set crawler.enabled to true, and that will enable it on those guys. You with me so far? Questions? Yes? So this is assuming that the crawler module has already been installed on those minions? Yes. Okay. If not, well, there's lots of ways to put it out there. Um, I wouldn't just put it under underscore modules because there's other stuff that I'm going to be putting in there along with it. Uh, right now in the uh, git repo, you'll notice there's a module and there's a runner. Um, I don't suppose they'll, they necessarily need each other at the moment on the same machine, but it's just sloppy to put half packages on there, right? There's ways to do that that are not the focus of this conversation. So notice we've uh, changed our client command that we've sent out. We have a new target, crawler.enabled, we're looking for true. So crawler.enabled is the name of the pillar. And uh, actually, really, look at that. Crawler.enabled true. It's pretty much what we're looking for, right? And at the, the end, we've noticed in EXPR, the expression form is pillar. If we don't do that, it's going to default to glob. There's also regular expressions available. There's grains available. What's regular expression? Is it just RE? Regex? PCRE. PCRE. Right, you're the one who made me I'm the one that talked him into PCRE. The, the funny thing about PCRE is the Perl is the only thing that doesn't actually do PCRE. <laughs> PCRE is not the same as Perl compatible regular expression. I'm sorry, Perl compatible reg regular expression is not the same as Perl regular expression. There's subtleties. But they're close enough for horseshoes, right? Okay, we set up a pillar. We've targeted the pillar. And now we're going to... Uh, put a function into our runner to, again, I just called it fetch. I'm low on imagination. We're going to do a call 
In fact, let me hop on over to our code real quick. This is not what I want. We'll start with this. This is our general purpose manage.py. You notice we've got a status function, we've got a down function, we've got an up function, and we have a versions function. And if you look at the down and the up functions, what do they do? Almost exactly the same thing. They're just calling up or down. And then somebody has gone and moved all the functionality into status. So it says, okay, first off, let's see who responds. Let's get a list of the people that responded. And then for down, let's subtract the key, or subtract that from the list of keys, and whoever, you know, whatever the difference is, those are the minions that are down, right? I really like that, so I, I stole it. And I'll probably update it. You notice again, down and up are still there. We have a status, and I've done something different in my status. Instead of running star, I've done caller.enabled is true. You guys recognize that? And then I put in the, fe the fetch function, which actually does something a little bit different than what my slides do. Again, it it's pulls a, min a list of all the minions that are up. In this case, these are the minions that are configured to be running the crawler, right? Because I've changed my, my status function. Um, and then I set up a new client and I say, okay, on those minions, or more specifically on the first one that I returned, go ahead and do this. Now I can actually put some logic in there and say, okay, um, I have a list of minions, let's go ahead and look at them, all of them and see who's the least busy and have him do the work. Right? That's why I've kind of broken it out like this. And this is what you'll see in the Git repo. So you can compare and contrast. Uh, and you'll notice I did something else at the end here. For the purposes of this demonstration, I don't care what the content is. So I'm going to hide it. In the slide, I just kind of blanked it out over here. And, uh, and then I dump it out. Let's, uh, let's take a look. So salt, run, fetch. I think I spelled it right that time. Dufresne is responding. And that is what Dufresne responded with. I blanked out the content because I don't care about it right now. That's all the crap I said I'd filter out. And otherwise, it looks pretty much like what we expected, right? Pretty much like what we got before. So now I have a way of, of taking all my data and turning it into something else, munging it into something else that's more useful for us. Now, is it really more useful for me at this point? Looks about the same, right? Uh, I could take this data and munge it into something entirely differently uh, and then shove it into a database somewhere. I could also just call the salt, the, uh, the salt module. Uh, you guys may remember the, uh, the returner from Seth's talk. I could use a returner to dump it into a database somewhere and then use it later on. I think that's all I've got. Uh, any other questions? Okay. For those of you that are interested, slides are available online. The, uh, the source is available in GitHub. Feel free to compare, contrast, yell at me, raise issues, ignore it. If anyone has questions, um, you know, I should probably, uh, I'll go into the slides and put my email in there if anyone has any questions. Okay. That's it.